2017 reminiscing with Jonah Carey. Let's have some fun. But first, topic of the day, Wade Davis signing. And you're still living in Denver, too, right? Yes, sir. All right. So what's the word? Well, the word is that they're going to go bullpen here. And this is the third significant signing of the offseason. You talk about uh, them re-signing Jake McGee, very quality left-hander. Well, Brian Shaw, the former uh, Cleveland Indian. And now the addition of Davis, who will replace Greg Holland, who himself had a pretty darn good year in Colorado. And it's obvious what's going on here. When you think about the history of the Rockies, free agent starters don't sign there. I mean, you can go back to the Denny Nagel, Mike Hampton, Bonanza of 2001, when every owner was worth a bazillion dollars because of the stock market. Well, that's not exactly the case anymore, and the irrational exuberance doesn't necessarily reign in quite the same way. And so the Rockies look at it and they say, okay, we're not going to get Arietta. We're not going to go get an a starter. Why don't we load up our bullpen and try to go for the model that the Royals, the Yankees, and some other teams of recent vintage have done? And this is what they're trying to do. Go with a young pitching staff, hope that it could survive rotation-wise. And then once you get into the sixth or seventh inning, just lock it down with some veterans in the tank. And relievers are getting more expensive on a yearly basis, but they're still cheaper than starting pitching. So, yeah, I like the plan so far. Let's reflect on 2017. So give me the one memory that you'll have on this year. What stood out to you? You always get, put a good perspective on this stuff. Well, I'll cheat and I'll go to just because there were two. First of all, I appreciate the home run chase. I mean, you look at Stanton and Judge and what they did. The fact they're on the same team now is trippy, too. But Stanton going to 59 was pretty impressive. Obviously didn't get to the to the heights, the Bonziest, Bonzi in the heights, but he was had a tremendous season. And, of course, Judge, you know, breaking the rookie record for home runs was 52. And here was a guy who had real holes in his swing. Certainly had power, but we didn't know how he would produce in the big leagues. What a huge breakout season for him. And then, you know, sidelight to that, well, sidelight, maybe the main story, of course, is that the Houston Astros won the World Series. And it's a great story in its own right. Here's a team that lost 100 games three years in a row. 0.0 local TV ratings not that long ago. They went for the bottom out. They went for a total tank job. And it actually worked. They were actually able to go from the total depth of Major League Baseball, I mean, one of the worst teams ever, to winning the World Series. And now they have a sustainable core of young talent. They could be dangerous for years to come. The rebuild plan, now two years in a row, we're seeing that. Totally scrap it down, build it back up. Cubs, Astros, are you okay with that? Because more teams are going to latch on, and there are plenty doing it now. Well, the thing, I'm a, I don't know, free market guy. You know, whatever it is, if you want to try it, try it. Go ahead. But the bottom line here is that if every team tries to do it, or if 12 teams try to do it, well, not everybody can win the World Series. Maybe the Cubs and the Astros were a little ahead of their time, but we'll see how it goes. And it's interesting to note that when you look at teams like the Phillies, for instance, that really did bottom out, they're not kind of going for the really depth of, of hell the way that the Astros did. They're saying, all right, we're going to go sign Carlos Santana. We're going to try to snap it back up a little bit quicker and not just totally go to the hole in that way. San Diego Padres, you know, have been rumored to be in on Eric Hosmer, same kind of thing. So maybe this is sort of the 2.0 version of this uh, tanking strategy where, it's, okay, we're going to be bad for a while, but we're not going to be Astros bad because we don't know if our fans can tolerate it or maybe they just don't think it's the best idea. Yeah, let's do four years instead of six years for sure. the rebuild. I like that. So let's push it forward. 2018, what are you looking forward to? You know, it's been interesting to watch the Cubs and the Astros win it all and you sort of feel for teams that haven't quite been able to get over the hump but have really talented and impressive teams and, and have come close. And I look at two of those clubs in the National League, that's the Los Angeles Dodgers, of course, the Dodgers go to a Game 7 in this year, and they don't quite get it done. Now, they're, they're no underdog story by any means. They have the richest payroll in all of baseball, a lot of premium talent. But the Dodgers are now going to be three decades without a World Series, so that's you know, starting to constitute a, dr- a drought in its own right. And in the American League, here's the longest drought in all of baseball. Of course, now the Cubs broke their streak, and that's Cleveland. you got to go back to the 40s since they last won the World Series agonizingly close in 2016, the 22-game winning streak in 17, and then they go into the playoffs and they don't quite get over the hump. And, you know, this is still an excellent team. they still got their core intact. They did lose Sean, Santana. They might lose a couple other guys. But they've got the skill. They've got the ability to do it. And the offseason is not done yet. We could see them add talents as well. I expect Cleveland to be a real contender. A Cleveland-Los Angeles World Series, that would not shock me at all going into 20. I'm in for that. Sign me up. And for Cleveland, I mean, you don't know how much longer the window is going to stay open. They'll have some guys that will be free agents after this year. I know Cody Allen, Andrew Miller, a couple other guys, too, and they just lost Carlos Santana. So also to look forward to in January, Jonah, Hall of Fame. We'll find out who makes it next. It looks like we'll get a nice little crop coming in again, at least, I think, three, if not four or five. So I know Tim Raines included you in his speech. Mm -hmm. So there are more guys with Expos-related uh, results going on right now in a positive direction. Vlad Guerrero, Larry Walker, you represent the Montreal people when you say, <laughs> I know you're in on Vlad, but what about Larry Walker, too? R- were you a guy that would vote for him? 
Uh, well, you know, as a fan, first for sure, Walker, I, you know, my childhood was Reigns and my adolescence and early adulthood was Walker. I like in the right field bleachers and the, my buddies and I held up a sign that said uh, Maple Ridge Boys, which is an homage to the Oak Ridge Boys, the country band, because Larry Walker was the Maple Ridge versus Columbia. Extremely obscure and nerdy, but Walker got it and would talk to us during games. So, of course, I want Larry Walker to get into the Hall of Fame. Does he have the credentials? I believe that he does. You know, Jay Jaffe, MLB Network contributor and a very smart guy, writes for SI. Uh, compiled a stack called Jaws, and Jaws basically takes an amalgam of career value and peak value for every player, every position, and looks at how they stack up compared to other Hall of Famers at their position. So you're not comparing Larry Walker to Dave Concepcion, you're comparing him to Mel Ott or to Shulis Joe Jackson or to Sam Crawford or Dewey Evans or Ichiro or Dave Winfield. That's what you're trying to do. By that standard, Larry Walker is above the average Hall of Famer. He's above a whole bunch of guys, including Tony Gwynn, by the way, his credentials are actually, by these numbers, more impressive than Tony Gwynn's because once you get off of batting average and you look at power and defense and speed and everything else, Walker was the quintessential five-tool guy, massively talented, and I don't buy the Colorado, Colorado argument that nullifies his numbers because on the road during those seasons, he had an OPS of almost 1,002. He was a phenomenal player, a terrific player in every respect, and I'm going to strip my bias away and say just statistically, if we just look at the advanced stats, Larry Walker is, in fact, a deserving Hall of Famer. And I want him to get in just for you to bring the signs back to Cooperstown and all that. Anyway, Jonah, Happy New Year to you. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks for having me.